stream. And as we know, we're going to keep doing that. That's uh, what we've been asked to do, and so we're going to continue that. I just want to begin this morning uh, by saying just a few things about worship. Um, we here at Congregational Bible Church have submitted to all the restrictions that the state of California has placed on us thus far. We canceled in-person services when we were told to. When we were told to only do live stream, we did that. Uh, we're following all the guidelines that the state has demanded that we adhere to. When we have in-person services, we're following all of those. We're limiting our numbers, we're providing masks, we're social distancing. But all the while, through all those things, we've been able to worship God in the way, in the manner, in the kind of worship that we feel the scripture calls on us to. But the new restriction regarding singing in church uh, is something that we cannot adhere to. Uh, we do not sing in church, we worship. Worship is one of the most frequent commands in all the Bible. Psalm 99.5, exalt the Lord our God and worship at his footstool. Psalm 29.2, worship the Lord in holy array. And more specific than just worship is the call to sing. Sing to the Lord. Psalm 7.17, I will sing praise to the name of the Lord. Psalm 21.13, we will sing and praise your power. Psalm 30, verse 4, sing praise to the Lord, you his godly ones. Psalm 47.6, Sing praises to God, sing praises. Sing praises to our King, sing praises. Worship is the proclamation of the worth of God. That is the root idea of the word. And so disallowing worship through song is not something that we can submit to. Uh, This has become a situation where the state is restricting the kind of worship that we are allowed to offer our God, and we will not succumb to that. Uh, We encourage all of our attendees to wear masks, socially distance, All of those things, churchgoers can still watch the live stream. Uh, But as the song goes, how can I keep from singing your praise? And that's what we're going to do to begin our service this morning. So let's stand together and let's worship the Lord through song. stumble in the darkness, I will call your name by night, God of wonders beyond our galaxy, you are holy, holy, the universe declares your majesty. Lord of heaven. 
Troubled times sing when I win. I can sing when I lose myself and I fall down again. I can sing with my last breath. Sing for I know that I'll sing with the angels and the saints around your throne. How can I keep from singing? To those around 
Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you.
Lord God, you are so infinitely worthy of all praise, Lord, that if our, our mouths were shut, God, the stones would cry out your praise and your worship and your glory. Uh, Lord, as you are so fitting and deserving of this morning and every day, and we even know in, into eternity and on through eternity, Lord, there will be praise and worship uh, to your holy name. And so we thank you for letting us gather this morning. Uh, and minister, hear, hear the word this morning and minister to one another. And we pray that you be honored, Lord, in everything that we do. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. And all the church said, Amen. 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 Now, would you turn around and wave to all those around you and then go ahead and have a seat? Uh, we have some uh, announcements to go over, and we'll do that. At this time, uh, coming up at the end of the month, July 27th, the week of July 27th, is our VBS. Uh, That's still on, that's still uh, going ahead as planned, at least at this point, uh, from 6 to 8 p.m. And we've got volunteers lined up, things ready to go for that. You can always still volunteer to help out with that. Uh, We'll always take more volunteers, even from decorating to serving to whatever. Uh, we'll probably have a cap, a limit of the number of kids that can come to that. Uh, and so we'll be, lo- be looking for uh, registration coming up very soon to get ready for VBS. There are some youth announcements. There's a youth game night on Friday the 10th here at the Church Fellowship Hall at junior high and high school. You can make note of that. Uh, there's going to be a movie night on Friday the 17th. And just the t- start time of that is just being determined. Operation Christmas Child, I know we do that. Uh, later in the fall, but there are some, well, hopefully, I don't know, there are back-to-school sales going on. <laughs> uh, normally, there's back-to-school sales going on, and we put this announcement in there for uh, you to look a great time to stock up for OCC, and I'm sure those things are probably going on, so um, be looking ahead for that, planning ahead for filling those shoe boxes. Um, as far as other church events, uh, Wednesday nights, we are going through the book of Micah, the prophet Micah, uh, the prophet of, uh, they call him the peasant's prophet, uh, the prophet of justice, the minor prophet Micah, um, which has really been a blessing to me thus far. I hope it has been to you, but we continue that at 7 p.m. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we'll be bringing back youth group. So youth group will start meeting on July 8th, that's this Wednesday, and we'll be meeting at the same time, from 7 to 8 p.m., uh, the youth group will go uh, with Pastor Spencer to another part of the church, and we'll be uh, doing our message of Micah in here, as well as live streaming. So there are still opportunities for you to uh, hear the Word of God, be connected, uh, even in the middle of the week. The Thursday morning ladies are taking the month of July off, so all the ladies involved in that study, please make note of that. The Anchored Sunday Night Bible Study is meeting on the 12th and the 26th at 7 p.m., and we do that via Zoom, and anyone is invited to that. Uh, We're actually going through the book of Revelation uh, in the Anchored group, and so that is a uh, blessed study so far with that. And then the Word Bible Study is also taking a break for the summer, so that's kind of what's going on here at the church, some of the events and things that we've got coming up, things that are happening. So you make note of that. If you have any questions, you can always uh, contact the church office or any one of our pastors, and we would love to answer any questions that you have. Uh, I'm going to lead us in a time of scripture and prayer, and I will be reading from Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11. Uh, The final four verses there, verses 33 through 36. And it is a familiar passage to us. Romans 11:33 says, "O oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who became his counselor?" Or who has first given to him that it might be paid back to him again? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Would you join me in prayer? Lord, the Apostle Paul here 
when he considers your faithful love to Israel as well as the church and how you are bringing all of that into resolution together. Uh, Lord, he can't help but proclaim the awesome nature of your wisdom and your knowledge. Lord, that there are none like you. Lord, the depths of your wisdom and your knowledge are unsearchable. Lord, we cannot wrap our minds around the divine wisdom you have in orchestrating the life of seven plus billion people on this planet all simultaneously at the same time. Lord, knowing every thought and every whisper and every deed in the lives of every one of those individuals simultaneously throughout the entire earth, God. That, that is your knowledge and that is your wisdom and you are working together all things for good and we just stand back in awe. Lord, there are so many things in our world that we do not understand and we don't get. Lord, we would like maybe an explanation, Lord, but we rest in knowing that you are infinitely wise and infinitely knowledgeable. Lord, your ways are unfathomable. You do things differently than us because you are holy and pure and because your knowledge is without end. Lord, who has known your mind? Who who has given you wisdom? Who has instructed you? Who has provided something that you do not have? Lord, the answer is no one, none. Lord, and so from you and through you and to you are all things. Lord, including the church, including your worship, including the saints, Lord, all of your believers all over this country and throughout the world, Lord, all things are from you and to you. Lord, all things will be for your glory. All things will be for you to be exalted. And Lord, we are humbled that you have decided to accomplish your will and accomplish your plan through us. That we, Lord, fallen creatures and selfish, get to be used in the infinite mind and infinite plan of God in bringing himself glory. Lord, that's why Paul sits back in awe and we do the same. Father, it's because of who you are that we can pray to you and we can, we can come to you. We can pray for the spiritual health and growth of our people. We can pray for the physical health and protection of our, of our people, Lord. Uh, we would pray for our government leaders, Lord, to use wisdom, divine wisdom, God, that you grant We pray that you give good, godly counselors to those in leadership. Lord, we pray that our worship would not be hindered. Lord, if you can establish and control all things since the beginning of time, then there is nothing too hard for you. And so we lift up to you the churches, the churches that exist throughout the world. We pray, Lord, that you would align things so that your Worship and praise may come unhindered and without restraint. Lord, remove any blockages of worship and praise and let us sing to you, Lord, with with hearts on fire. We pray that you continue to work amongst our people. Lord, exalt yourself, grow us, bring us further into the knowledge of Christ. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing a hymn. And so if you could stand at this time, we'll be singing the old rugged cross.
Would you please be seated? It's amazing, isn't it? With all the technology and all the advancement, um, the centerpiece of our entire faith is still an old rugged cross. It's 
Isn't that right? Uh, we're going to be in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. So I invite you to turn there. We'll be reading verses 3 through 8 as we begin. First Thessalonians 4, verses 3 through 8. And the Word of God says this. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. That is, that you abstain from sexual immorality that each of you know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in lustful passion like the Gentiles who do not know God, and that no man transgress and defraud his brother in the matter, because the Lord is the avenger in all these things, just as we also told you before and solemnly warned you. For God has not called us for the purpose of impurity, but in sanctification. So he who rejects this is not rejecting man, but the God who gives his Holy Spirit to you. When the human race fell into sin in Genesis chapter 3, the descent into chaos was quick. Depravity came about suddenly. As we go from eating a forbidden fruit to the cold-blooded murder of a sibling. But the descent into sin was also seen very clearly in the area of sexual morality. That before the fall, Scripture says Adam and Eve were naked and they were not ashamed... And then soon afterwards, the descent into perverse sexual sin was also very quick as well. In the book of Genesis alone, we have described the sexual sins of polygamy, of Lamech and others, the naked perversion of Noah, the adultery of Abram, the homosexuality of Sodom and Gomorrah, the incest of Lot's daughters, the rape of Dinah, and the prostitution, involvement in prostitution of Judah and Tamar. So from chapter 3 to chapter 38, in just 35 chapters, we have polygamy, perversion, adultery, homosexuality, incest, rape, and prostitution. One of the clear effects of sin upon the human race will be seen in the area of sexual immorality. It will become one of the most vivid examples of the sinful heart. The depravity of man will come out there. As we discussed last week, it seems that all kinds of things are now socially acceptable. In fact, embraced, celebrated. And if that's the culture that we live in, then it is all the more imperative upon Christians to follow the biblical sexual ethic that is given in the Word. The last time we defined that biblical sexual ethic, really just in two statements or two commands, abstain from all immorality, that's verse 3, abstain from all immorality, but then thinking through the flip side of that would be to adhere closely to God's standards. Abstaining from all immorality would be any sexual behavior, any sexual activity that is outside of the marriage bed between one man and one woman. And so if you're going to adhere to God's standards of sexuality, it would be to maintain that standard, one man and one woman in a marriage relationship. That was the overall call of what we were supposed to do. But the rest of the verses, 3 through 8, tell us why. 
Why should we earnestly obey this sexual ethic? And in this text, there are six powerful reasons, compelling reasons for a Christian to make this a serious priority and to earnestly obey what the Bible says about sexuality in those two commands. Abstaining from all immorality, keeping away from it, and adhering closely to God's standards. Six powerful reasons. And number one is this. Because this is the will of God. This is the will of God. You know, the will of God has wrongly been assumed to be something obscure, hidden, secretive, difficult to find, like a, like a treasure map with a, or a, a puzzle. You have to try to figure it out. Well, verse 3 is one of those situations where the will of God is laid out very clearly. Verse 3, this is the will of God. Your sanctification, that is, that you abstain from sexual immorality. It says very distinctly, this is God's will. This is his desire for you. It is to abstain from all immorality. And actually, the broader instruction there about the will of God is your sanctification. Did you catch that in verse 3? This is the will of God, your sanctification. And then he further explains that. He defines what specifically, what specific area of sanctification he's talking about. It's in the area of purity and abstaining from immorality. And so that causes us to ask, what is sanctification? It must be pretty important because it comes up three times in this passage. Verse 3, verse 4, and verse 7. Sanctification is the idea of separation. It is the idea to be unlike. That that is God's will for his people to be different, to be distinct, to be separated from sin, separated from the world. Uh, but it's not just a negative thing. It's not just, you know, go hide in a cave somewhere. There's a positive element as well. It is be separated unto holiness. Be separated from sin, but move toward holiness. That is what God wants. That is God's desire. That is His will. A Christian should be markedly different than the culture around him, because that is the will of God, separation. Do you remember what God said to Israel when they went into the promised land? He brought them into the land, but he told them to be distinct, be separate, do not take on the morals and the values of the Canaanites. Listen to Leviticus 20, verse 26. Thus you are to be holy to me, for I, the Lord, am holy, and I have set you apart from the peoples to be mine. That's Leviticus 20, 26. You are going into the land, you will be around the people there, you will be in their midst, but you are holy to me, says God. And by the way, in that context, in Leviticus 20, it is a chapter dealing with issues of immorality. Don't be like the nations in their definitions of sexuality. Be holy. That's the will of the Lord. God's clearly defined will is laid out here. There are other passages as well in Scripture where God's will is plainly told. It is not hidden and obscure. Here, God's will is clearly Sanctification, further defined as separation from all immorality. And this is very similar and consistent with Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. We know that verse, do not be conformed, but be transformed. Do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed. And then the rest of the verse says, so that you may prove what the will of God is. The will of God. So we cannot say, I don't know God's will when it comes to matters of sexuality or relationships. 
Friends, if it leads you to immorality, it is against the will of God. People like to think, well, I don't know, is this, is this one, is this guy, is this girl, are they for me, are they the one for me? If the relationship leads you to immorality, it's not the will of God. And let me just say, in regards to the will of God, many people only think of the will of God in terms of big decisions only. They think like, well, I'm, I'm thinking of starting a new job, or I'm thinking of moving, or having surgery, or something like that. And they go, I really need to try to find out the will of God. But we should be concerned with the will of God every day. Not just in the big decisions. If you are concerned about God's will in every little decision throughout the day, it will help you in your battle against immorality. But this is the will of God. Sanctification. Separation. The Christian should be the peculiar one. The strange one. To the world, in regards to their definition of sexuality. This is the will of God, and the Christian should seek to satisfy that which is God's desire. Now, number two, because this is real self control. This is real self control. The scripture calls on us to be in be in self control at all times. To master our lusts, to master our desires, to master our bodies. Uh, Paul says, I think it's 1 Corinthians 9, I buffet my body and make it my slave. Like I assault myself, not physically, but he's saying I restrain the desires of my flesh. The fruit of the Spirit. One of them is what? Self-control. Look at verse 4. That each of you know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor. Now there is a difficulty in translation here. Some of you may have footnotes there. Because the word possess could also be translated acquire or get. And the word vessel could be used for a spouse. It is in 1 Peter 3. So is Paul saying, there's two really different views here. Is Paul saying... Each of you should know how to acquire his own wife. Get a wife if you have issues. Or is he saying, control your body. Possess your own vessel. It is true that wives are called vessels in 1 Peter 3, 7. And acquire could be a legitimate translation. But the better understanding is in the area of self-control. Gain control over your body. Because the word for vessel, the word vessel there, is used for, for the body in 2 Corinthians 4, 7, 2 Timothy 2, 21, and Acts 9, 15. So possess or gain mastery of your own body is really what he's saying. If he was saying acquire a wife then he's really greatly dishonoring the institution of marriage. Because he's basically just saying, well, if you have problems with immorality, just go get a wife. It's kind of a low view of marriage, and and frankly, it's a low view of women. It's a very man-centered instruction, uh, ignoring women and considering them just as uh, the fulfillment of a desire. So the better translation here is, as the NAS has it, Correct. Possess your own vessel in sanctification and honor. Control yourself. Obtain mastery over your body. And not just a momentary impulse, but make it a habit. It is a struggle won by consistent effort. Control yourself. Control your body. Control your urges. In fact... Some commentators believe that he's actually being more specific than just the body. That when he says, know how to control your own vessel, he might even be talking of the reproductive organs specifically. Control yourself. Everything that the world has to say about sexuality is what? Indulge yourself. Go for it. If it feels good, do it. The Christian... 
self-control, restraint, abstain. Know your weaknesses. Know your struggles. Maybe it's certain conversations that cause you to lust. Cut them out. Maybe it's certain types of media. Get rid of it. Exercise that area of self-control. Control your body, as it says, in sanctification and honor. There's that word sanctification again. But honor as well. Respect. Respect your own body and keep it pure. It is a temple of the Holy Spirit. It belongs to God. Glorify God with your body. Sexual sin defiles our body. And so exercise self-control. You know, people can have a a measure of self-control over a lot of things. Some people can work out consistently. They can maybe do yoga. Maybe people control their spending. Maybe people control their eating. Real self-control. Real spirit-empowered, sanctified self-control is in the area of sexuality. This is real self-control. Number three, this is distinct from the unsaved. This is distinct from the unsaved. We're talking about that, the definition of sanctification. It just runs throughout this passage. The sexual ethic of Scripture is unique. It's different from the world. It's supposed to be. But notice verse 5. It builds off of verse 4. But verse 4 is, possess your own vessel in sanctification and honor. And then verse 5, not, like here's the opposite, not in lustful passions like the Gentiles who don't know God. We are to control ourselves and to be clearly different from the Gentiles or those that don't know God who do not have that control. They live in lustful passions. That's the idea of Gentiles. That's the idea of, as it says, those that do not know God. It is simply a reference to the unsaved. The unsaved do not have this kind of self-control. They live in such a way that they are at the mercy of their passions all the time. Their desires drive them. They must fulfill their urges. They cannot exercise that restraint and self-control. 2 Timothy 3.3, 3, as it lists some of the behaviors that will come up at the end of times, it says one of those is a lack of self-control. No matter how much they try, they cannot restrain the flesh. They may gain a short-term victory here or there, but they do not have the Holy Spirit, they do not have new life, and so they live at the mercy of their lusts and their passions. That's what he's saying. This is exactly what Romans 1 teaches, Romans 1, verses 24 through 28. And it actually says that the unbeliever wants his sin so much that God gives them over to their sin. That God allows them to be at the mercy of these degrading passions. As if God were to say, you want your sin so bad, you can have it. And so the unsaved and the unregenerate are people who live as slaves to their sexual appetites. And that is what is so heinous about sin, is that it gains mastery over you, if you allow it to to continue. And those that are enslaved in it, it shows it is part of the judgment of God, that he has given them over to their sin. That they are ruled by their desires, they are ruled by their passions, and they see it and say, it is my master and I must obey no self-control. Galatians 4.8 says it. When you did not know God, you were slaves to those things which by nature are no gods. You were enslaved. And the unbeliever is enslaved to his lusts. He is enslaved to his sin, to his passions, to his desires. Second Peter 2.19. Whatever a man is overcome by, to that he is enslaved. It can be anything. If it overcomes you consistently and you cannot stop it, you are enslaved to it. The Bible doesn't use the word addiction. It uses the word enslavement. You are not a sex addict. You are enslaved to your lusts. 
but you see the clear call for differentiation. You, Christian, must not be. They run wild and out of control. You must not. You must live in a way that's different and distinct. And unfortunately, that is not the case. The sexuality of Christians is becoming more and more similar to the world. We are losing that separation. We are losing that distinctiveness. Consider the examples of divorce, adultery, premarital sex, cohabitation, all of those things. Are those going on in the Christian community? What about the issue of homosexuality? Well, the majority of the, of the Christian church has now embraced that sin as normal. What about something like pornography? 50% of Christian men are addicted to pornography. 50%. That's not the world. That's the church. And so that line, that distinction between the Gentiles and believers is blurring more and more in the area of sexuality. But it is a self-control and restraint that is to distinguish a Christian from the world. An unbeliever must live at the mercy of his passions. A Christian does not. Remember, in all through this passage, God is not destroying physical desire and he is not destroying physical urges. He is sanctifying it. And he is saying, live with it under control. Live differently than the unsaved. Number four, because this escapes the Lord's vengeance. This escapes the Lord's vengeance. Verse six, that no man transgress and defraud his brother in the matter because the Lord is the avenger in all these things. The church is warned, do not transgress and defraud another brother or sister in this area, in the area of immorality. And it's weird because Paul uses business terminology here, and there's actually some commentators that think Paul's switched gears and he's, he's now talking about business practices because transgress and defraud, those are business terms. The conversation, though, is still about immorality, as verse 7 makes it clear. He's talking about purity, not impurity. But he uses the business terminology because he's saying leading another brother or sister into immorality is an act of transgressing and defrauding them. And Jesus spoke very powerfully about leading other Christians into sin in Matthew 18, it would be better, as you know this passage, right? It would be better for a millstone to be hung around his neck and be drowned in the sea. That's Matthew 18. Do not lead other believers into sin. Do not defraud any other person in the area of sexuality. Every sinful sexual act is not just a violation of God's law. It is a violation of that other person. Even the image of a person on a screen, it is still a real person. As one person says, one commentator, every other person, you have to see every other person is having a no trespassing sign. And all trespassers will be prosecuted. That's what verse 6 says. Hebrews 13.4 says the marriage bed is to be undefiled. And so every act of sexual sin outside of the marriage bed defiles it. It defiles the bed. Both people involved. God has graciously given the marriage bed as a gift to the marriage relationship. And every act of sexual sin defiles it and shames it. I remember a young man coming in for counseling years ago. He was having numerous encounters with girls, as many as he could have. And he came because he was worried about getting a girl pregnant. 
And as I sat across from him, I, I told him, you are defiling the marriage bed of all these young girls. As well as your own, it is now stained and it is tarnished. But even more than that, you are bringing down the judgment and the wrath of God upon yourself. As it says in verse 6, the Lord will avenge all these things. These sexual sins, he will avenge it. The Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ is the first avenger. And he is the strongest avenger. Friends, sexual sin just adds to your wrath. This, this culture is adding wrath to itself as they continually defy God's orders. And so people who are taken advantage of and purity that is stolen, it is the Lord that will avenge that. This is about the wrath of God, as verse 6 makes it clear. Look at the end of the verse. We told you before, and we solemnly warned you. What do you have to solemnly warn people about? Something bad, something dangerous. The Lord's wrath. As Hebrews 13, 4 says, as I read it before, the marriage bed is to be undefiled. Then the rest of the verse says this, because fornicators and adulterers God will judge. If someone says, well, I'm a Christian, so I'm already safe, right? I'm safe from God's wrath. Well, if you continue on knowingly involved in sexual sin, then that salvation would be seriously questioned. And you might be ready for the Lord to discipline you hard. The Lord may chastise you. The Lord may punish you for that engagement in sin. Just because you are saved does not give you the right to sin without any consequences. And the Lord will avenge, the Lord will act, because it is His great name that is tied to the behavior of His people. Just ask King David if you can go ahead and sin sexually without any consequences. The Lord will avenge. Number five, because this is God's calling. This is God's calling, verse Seven, God has not called us for the purpose of impurity, but in sanctification. Again, the call to sanctification. But focus on the word impurity. All of these immoral behaviors are impure, they are unclean, they defile the body. 1 Corinthians 6.28 says that. The immoral man sins against his own body, that he spoils and corrupts himself. And that is not what God has called us to. God's call is his summoning his, de his demand to, to come out, to come forth, to go from here to there. God called us in salvation. He called us out of sin and into righteousness. And so God's calling is not for us to remain in impurity and defilement. It is to sanctification. It is to be pure and holy, the opposite of any impurity. But does God know what he's talking about? God's call... Does he know what he's doing in the area of purity? Is he right? Is he just a, is he just a, a cosmic a prude who's trying to take away everybody's fun? Just consider this situation for a minute. If everyone in the world suddenly adhered to God's demands for sexuality, immediately, if everyone in the world immediately adhere to one man and one woman in a marriage relationship, what would be the effect on the world? Well, just consider this. There would be an immediate end to all adultery and all the accompanying pain that goes along with it. All STDs would vanish, including things like AIDS. Single moms, deadbeat dads, broken homes would all go away. Unwanted pregnancies, abortions, adoptions, rape, prostitution, sex trafficking, sexual assaults, sexual harassment, and the shame and embarrassment and regret of past sexual encounters, all of that would go away. All of it would disappear. But you know what? God just, God doesn't know what he's talking about, does he? That's what man thinks. We have to be liberated from all of his rules. And you know, Adam and Eve fell for the same type of temptation. 
Remember what God told them? You can eat freely from the garden. You just can't eat from that one tree. And Satan spun it to where, they, to where they thought, you know what, God is so restrictive, he won't let us eat from the tree? And in regards to sexuality, God says, here is the marriage bed. It is my gift to you. And man says, you're holding me back. And maybe God is holding us back from all the pain and all the sorrow that we just chronicled, that we just listed. God knows what is best for you, Christian. He knows. And so follow his instructions. This is your calling. It is a good calling. So if a Christian wants to know, I wonder what is God's calling for my life. Well, number one is purity. And lastly, number six, because this is God given. This is God given. This entire passage comes from the mind of God, and it is clear because this would never come from the mind of sinful man. Man's mind is perverted, and so man would never seek to restrain or restrict his perversion. He would always seek to provide as many ways as possible to be able to indulge his perversion. But notice verse 8. He who rejects this, all of this instruction that, that he's just given, he who rejects this is not rejecting man, but the God who gives his Holy Spirit to you. If you reject this call to a biblical sexual ethic, this call to abstinence from all immorality and to adhere closely to God's standards, you do not reject man, you do not reject me, you do not reject the pastor, you do not reject the church or organized Christianity, you reject God. You say, what do you mean you reject God? You reject His authority. His right to issue commands, His, his rightful place as sovereign over your life. Have you ever heard someone say, why does God care what I do with my body? Why does God care what I do in the privacy of my own bedroom? Here's why. Because he is the all-sovereign ruler of the universe who gave you life and who keeps you alive today. And your body is his. It belongs to him. And so his definition of sexuality is what is, is, what is authoritative and not yours. He provided you with sexual desires, and then he gave you the appropriate outlet in which to fulfill that. And man says, no, I'll do what I want. You don't tell me what to do, God. You don't tell me what to do. So that makes it clear. It's not about love. It's not about liberation. It's not about progressive thinking. It is rejection. It is a cold-hearted rejection of God's rightful place as ruler over this entire universe. And for you, Christian, to reject this is to reject also his gift of restraint, which is listed here as the Holy Spirit in verse 8. That the Holy Spirit has been given to you, Christian, to aid in your sanctification. The Holy Spirit is a gift from God to drive you to holiness and purity. And to disregard the commands of God is to disregard the Holy Spirit as well. And did you notice the references, the, the total reference to the Trinity here? You have the will of God in verse 3. You have the Lord Jesus Christ in verse 6. And you have the Holy Spirit in verse 8. This, the entire Godhead in complete unity in the area of sexuality, as well as everything else. This is the divine given instruction from God himself. Do not reject it. Now, these are powerful reasons, aren't they? They hold much weight. They are very compelling. But we cannot just acknowledge them as good reasons without doing anything. We have to put them into practice. It is time for the church to lead the way in terms of purity in the culture. Not to point 
and shout at all the immoral things that goes on out there in the world, but for the church to purify and sanctify herself. This is the biblical sexual ethic. The question for all of us is, are we living by it? Join me in prayer as we close our time. Father, powerful words. Powerful words of sanctification and holiness and purity. Lord, we see exactly what your will is. We see exactly what you have to say, Lord, and we have to adhere to it and obey it, Lord, with all earnestness. Lord, we confess the sexuality of the church is not as different from the world as it needs to be. Lord, we want to repent of that. We pray for your help. We pray for your Holy Spirit to give a new a new passionate call towards restraint and adherence in this area. We pray for purity amongst your people, Lord. This is your calling. This is your will. This is how we remain distinct. We pray for that Holy Spirit to give us that self-control over all these areas. And Lord, that we would rejoice in the sexuality that you've provided. And so, Lord, we pray that you would help your church. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. And all the church said, Amen. Amen. And you are dismissed this morning.